Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at vafb.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all the wonderful products we enjoy, brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Just what does a soil and water conservation district do? We'll explain. Chef Maxwell puts a Virginia twist on a traditional Italian dish and agriculture is a vital part of Essex County, Virginia. Welcome back everyone. We're coming to you this week from the northern neck of Virginia where farmers have been raising crops since colonial times. And for them, their best partner is their local soil and water conservation district. Government efforts to preserve farmland and precious soil date back to 1935 when Congress ordered the U.S. Department of Agriculture to create the Soil Conservation Service. Soil erosion had been recognized as a serious threat to American agriculture, but the Dust Bowl years emphatically highlighted the need for concerted efforts. Soil and water conservation districts develop comprehensive programs and plans to conserve soil resources, control and prevent soil erosion, prevent floods, and conserve, develop, utilize, and dispose water. Today, 47 districts serve as local resources for citizens in nearly all Virginia localities. Districts manage conservation programs, employ staff, and deliver free conservation services. Kathy Clark is the district operations manager for the Northern Neck District. Each of us cover a different locality. Some cover just counties. Some have a mixture with cities as well. The districts evolved um, out of the need, as you said, for soil erosion issues. But over the years, they've grown and developed. Um, we have a heavier concentration now on water quality as well. So the programs, uh, as a result of that, have grown tremendously. And the audience, it's not just agriculture, it's everyone. We all have a hand and um, making sure that our natural resources are clean. Since the mid-1980s, the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation, or DCR, has relied heavily on districts to help deliver many programs aimed at controlling and preventing non-point source pollution. NPS pollution is caused by rainfall or snow melt moving over and through the ground. As the runoff moves, it picks up and carries away natural and human-made pollutants. With their volunteer boards and more than 150 full and part-time employees, districts provide a valuable resource to help control pollution and runoff into the Chesapeake Bay. Part of the Soil and Water Conservation District's efforts include implementation of the Virginia Agricultural BMP Cost Share Program, which helps farmers use best management practices by decreasing runoff into streams, rivers, and ultimately into the bay. We have 95% participation from producers located in our four counties here in the Northern Neck. The farmers in this area are extremely appreciative of, of the help that we can give them. We, in turn, we provide them a, a small amount of cost share but um, we're getting a lot of implementation on the ground and a lot of benefits um, that also goes back to help with our water quality goals for 2025. Randall Packett, a Richmond County farmer, has received the Virginia Clean Water Farm Award from DCR for his work implementing conservation plans on his farm. Like most Virginia farmers, Packett goes above and beyond to protect his land and the nearby waterways. My reward is maintaining the soil and paying streams and still having good yields and making profit. Um, conservation farming is just a positive all, all the way around. One of the primary techniques Packett uses on his farm, like many others, is no-till farming. No-till farming doesn't disturb topsoil during planting. It's a simple principle backed by the conservation district that continues to reap big environmental benefits. There have been some field tests done around here to check runoff after heavy rain and the water comes off clear, so obviously we're doing something right. Um, when I first started farming, we plowed for every crop and disked it multiple times. You'd get a rain, it would run off. 
When I was small right here in Richmond County, every herd of cattle ran in the water, oftentimes in the Rappahannock. No one does that anymore. Everyone's invested a lot of capital in making sure that livestock stays over the waterways. While district offices often do work with Virginia farmers, they are beginning to focus their attention on urban areas and residential communities, where pollution sources have been found from front lawns to local retail businesses. We have a grant program running through the Virginia Association of Soil Water Conservation Districts called VCAP, Virginia Conservation Assistance Program, and that is for urban areas. There's a lot of problems that haven't been addressed in the past on the urban side um, with rainwater, the stormwater problems that we're having, and we need to start focusing on some of those. District offices help all Virginia citizens who are looking for ways to protect the lands, resources, and waterways. More information on programs offered by your local water and conservation district can be found at dcr.virginia.gov. Follow the links for soil and water conservation. When Congress created the Soil Conservation Service in 1935, modern farming proponents realized local landowners had to be included in the effort. In 1937, Congress approved a model law for local soil conservation districts, usually organized along county and city lines. Today, there are more than 3,000 local districts across the nation. In 1938, the Tidewater District, serving Essex County, was Virginia's first soil and water conservation district. Today, there are 47 districts in the Old Dominion, each led by locally elected leaders who address the specific conservation needs of their communities. I'm Mark Viet, coming up on In the Garden, I'm going to talk about what you can do with winter damage to your plants. Stay with us. More than 90 years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made a promise to our local farmers to protect and preserve a way of life they'd worked so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member and enjoy the many benefits of membership. There's a local Farm Bureau in every county of the state. We think everyone should be a friend of the farm. Visit our website at VAFB.com to learn more. Winter weather can be harsh on your garden plants and shrubs. Mark Viet has some suggestions on cleaning out the deadwood in the garden. During the spring, it becomes a little more evident, especially on our evergreens, some of the damage that occurs during the winter. Now, it just doesn't mean real cold temperatures that occurred. It could be an early frost, an early freeze, could happen in November, could happen in December. But what happens is after the winter, you finally see the evidence of damage. And, you know, I've talked to some people that have hollies and all the leaves are brown and, you know, around Richmond. And you'll see some of that here. What do you do? The real key is to be patient and wait. It could take up to three months for the damage to show up on your evergreens. And right here, one of the boxwoods. And I find it interesting that on some sides of this building, there is no damage. But on some portions where maybe this is sort of south, east facing, there's a lot of damage. So it could vary throughout your entire garden. But sometime in May or June, you can go out and prune out the damage because by that time, you'll know how far back the damage occurred. Another plant that commonly gets affected is the yew. And the main reason is many of us prune them in August, it sends out new growth, and it gets damaged. Well, what do you do with the damage? In this case, just the hand shears, you can go right out with the hand shears and selectively prune. I really prefer a hand shears than the automatic shears in this case, but you can do this in May, you could do it in June. If you see any more damage, even in July. Now, there are some plants that you may have to cut back pretty hard. A common plant that many of us have might be the gold dust plant with the yellow spots or just the green form. One of the things I learned about this plant, it can handle heavy shade, but it is subject 
to winter damage in many areas. As you see here, the tips freeze back during the winter. And what you can do is sometimes take a knife and scratch the bark to see if it's green or brown or cut through the stems as I've done here. And this is nice and healthy and green. This one here has a little brown and this one here is severely damaged. And where it looks nice and healthy, you just come in with your hand shears and you start pruning. You wanna make sure you try to prune to nice, healthy, green and prune out the dead. That's one option. Well, the other option is if you have a lot of damage, you might have to resort to a better or loppers or shears and you're going to come in and you can cut back pretty hard. Just like this. And I'll tell you, as soon as you're done, the plant's going to look better and you're going to find nice fresh growth coming out. I'm Mark Fiet. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Virginia pork is always a welcome dish. Chef John Maxwell takes a classic Italian dish and puts a Virginia spin on it next in the heart of the home. There are 30,000 roadway accidents each year involving cars and farm machinery. Farmers will be moving equipment for planting and harvest season. The slow moving vehicle triangle in red and fluorescent orange colors and flashing lights allow for quick identification. When you see an SMV sign on farm equipment, slow down, prepare for sudden stops and slow turns. Patience will save lives. Just remember we all need to share the road, we all need to be responsible, and we need to be guided by the law. Motor vehicle safety starts with you. Piccata sauce is simply lemon, parsley, and butter. It's so versatile that any meat entree can be used to make a meal. Chef John Maxwell chooses to use Virginia pork in this easy recipe in the heart of the home. Hi, welcome to the heart of the home. I'm Chef John Maxwell, and we're here at Meadow Hall in Meadow Event Park in Doswell, Virginia, and we've got a great recipe for you today using great Virginia pork. Right? So typically this dish is done with veal, but we've got such a robust pork industry here that I wanted to feature that. We're going to start the whole dish called pork piccata. It's a, a traditional Italian dish and it goes with pasta. So the first thing I'm going to do is get this pasta hot uh, so I can build my plate. Now this takes very little time to actually cook a piccata. So this is there. I'm going to let this drain. And that's coming out onto this platter. So I'm going to dredge these um, pork cutlets that I've pounded out slightly with a meat mallet to make them consistent and thin. Not to make them too thin, but make them consistent. And I got butter hot in the stove, on the stove, and I'm going to saute these off very quickly. Right. I love the way it sounds when these get start sizzling and popping. Just want to, they're so thin, they cook through pretty quickly. I'm not interested in them necessarily being brown. I'm just going to lay them straight, o straight over the top of this bowl of pasta. Now, as soon as I'm finished, I'm going to wipe this pan out a little bit and add a little bit more oil to it um, so that I can do the, the sauce right behind it. Okay, I've got a pan with a little bit of olive oil in here, um, getting hot. So we're ready to start adding our ingredients. I'm going to start with some garlic. Piccata is garlic. All right. I'm going to add some, the white part of green onion. Right. Stir that around. I love the sound of that stuff cooking. All right. I'm going to add some mushrooms. All 
and let those saute around a little bit. They'll lose a lot of moisture as they're cooking. So I wanted to get my vegetables kind of started in the saute because as soon as the mushrooms leach out the moisture, it slows the cooking process down. Okay, and these are starting to color just a little bit. Now I'm going to add a little bit of lemon juice. A little bit of white wine. Let that go. Now I'm going to add a little bit of capers and some chopped parsley and some chopped green onions. The green tops. We used the whites a little earlier. All right. Now what I want to do is simmer this long enough to reduce the uh, the liquid a little bit, just to concentrate the flavor. And put a little pepper in here. All right, while that's sauteing, I'm going to take a lemon and cut some slices. And the slices I'm going to put into that hot liquid just for a couple of minutes to soften them up. So they can be the, uh, the lemony garnish for this. Okay, and this is it. This is all done. Get these mushrooms. A little lemon on top. And I think that's about as good as it's going to get. And there we are, pork piccata on fettuccine. Manja. So join us next week on Heart of the Home, where we get to play with great Virginia food. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at VAFB.com, as well as on Chef Maxwell's website at ChefJohnMaxwell.com. Pork is Virginia's ninth most valuable farm commodity, generating farm sales of $67.7 million a year. And Virginia ham is famous around the world. Smithfield, Virginia is home to the world's largest pork producing company, Smithfield Foods. In addition to more than 500 hog farms owned directly by Smithfield, another 2,000 farms raise pigs under contract to the company. Smithfield produces and processes more than 6 billion pounds of pork a year. Essex County was first visited by Captain John Smith in 1607. As part of our series on county agriculture close-ups, Dave Miller reports that this beautiful rural community on the banks of the Rappahannock River is truly an agriculture powerhouse. Bounded on the north side by the Rappahannock River, Essex County was one of the first parts of Virginia to be settled by English pioneers in the early 1600s. The town of Rappahannock was established in 1682 as a port to ship tobacco and other agricultural exports. More than a century ago, Essex County became a tourist and retirement destination as visitors took advantage of the beautiful river country, relaxed lifestyle, and salt water. While local agriculture is different than centuries ago, farming continues to define the community's economy. It used to be a few more livestock in the area, but that's kind of gone away and uh, we're not really in the area. We're more known for growing crops. And of course we had the river, Rappahank River, we know, you know, for that. And then we've got the oysters and all that type of stuff. So we've got a lot going on for us. We have some really, really good farmers in Essex County. Uh, they're interested in trying new things uh, like precision agriculture. We are very much a cash grain and soybean production area, but we've got people who have done things value added in that, such as seed production, also growing food grade soybeans, also growing hard wheats uh, for flour mills 
out in the western part of the state and other parts of the state. There are 98 farms in Essex County, covering almost 57,000 acres. Most of the farm income, $22.8 million, is generated by the sale of corn, wheat, soybeans, and small grains. Forestry accounts for about $4.4 million annually. Another $300,000 a year comes from cattle sales and nearly $200,000 from nursery and greenhouse products. There are also a few aquaculture operations, horses, hogs, and goats in Essex County, and even an alpaca farm. Farming is a family affair in Essex, as many of the farms have been run by several generations. It's a great feeling to, to of course, watch your crops grow and uh, that you've planted it, you've done the best you can, and then at the end that you actually have reaped the rewards, hopefully that you've had a good year. Uh, the worst feeling uh, as a farmer to me is, of course, when we're in a drought and you have to get up every morning and walk out the door and you're watching your crops withering away. And that, that's, a, that's the hardest emotional experience that I feel as a farmer that we take. We haven't lost a whole lot to development, and I'm certainly thankful for that, but the number of producers has gone down, and the sheer size of the acreage that these operations work now, and this, the, some of our farm operations in this area are our big, biggest businesses in our county. Uh, they turn over a lot of money, they employ lots of people, but that has definitely changed from the standpoint there used to be more smaller growers, but definitely now we've got, very, we've got larger operations, and I, another thing to me is the capacity of the equipment. What the equipment will do now compared to 25 years ago, uh, it's just amazing to me. While there's certainly a lot of history in Essex County, farmers here are not stuck in the past. They are some of the most progressive in the state when it comes to farm technology and protecting the environment. What's really astounding is the level of technology that has come into equipment. Um, we're, we're able to use GPS and controllers and, and we can sit down on the computer in December and January and tell each spot in the field how many seeds we want, how much fertilizer we want, and, and we can upload those into the controllers and as we drive across the field, uh, the controllers handle it and they put exactly what nutrients and seeds and inputs we want in a certain spot and they'll put it in that spot and we can take areas that are more productive more inputs there in areas that are less productive, we can save input costs and, and, and help the environment by just using what we need, where we need it. While these are, these are business folks, they're also very cognizant of being environmentally sound. Uh, we're in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. The northern side of the county borders the Rappahannock River. And I think these growers realize that we need to do, do their role as far as controlling non-point source pollution. So as we, we do run businesses, but we understand, they understand the importance of being good conservationists. Agriculture is big business here in Essex County, but to farmers here, it's also a way of life they can't imagine living without. There's no other better place on the face of the earth to raise a family. Uh, I have an autistic child and it, it helps that he can be, he can go with me and he can ride around on the farm or, he, you know, he can move. Whereas if we were doing some other occupation, it might be harder on him. So it's just a great way to, 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 to uh, grow up. Whether they're driving a tractor or harvesting timber, Essex County farmers are doing what they've always done and passing the torch to the next generation of farmers and leaders. In Essex County, Virginia, I'm Dave Miller. That's going to do it for this edition of Real Virginia. We are so glad you could join us to celebrate the bounty Virginia has to offer. Whether it's in your home, your garden, or your landscape, we are proud to say that this is Real Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a good week. Chesapeake Bay